the average millionaire has three to nine income streams. But if you actually study them and what they do, they started with one niche, they got good at it, and then they were able to add streams of income to that niche. If you're finding value in what you're watching, consider hitting the subscribe button and turning on the bell notification. Oh, and don't forget to drop a comment. I love hearing your thoughts and ideas. By the way, we have got a ton of other videos waiting for you. And if you are ready to level up your mindset, come hang out with us in our private Facebook group called Mindset for Business Success. Welcome to Super Entrepreneurs Podcast. Today we have with us Rob Moore. Rob is an entrepreneur for over 20 years. He's an author, investor, podcaster, and speaker, self-made multimillionaire with a mission to help as many people on the planet get better financial knowledge. Welcome to our show, my friend. Thank you for having me on. It was great to have you. We met before when I first started the show. You honored us with your presence, and that was a, a great cause. I'm, I'm grateful to have you back. Congratulations for being one of the few podcasters that gets beyond episode 29. I think that's the average yeah. number of episodes a podcaster does. Yeah, I, I heard 14, so I don't know, 20, Woo. 39. Yeah, yeah so yeah. It's, it's because people want the instant grat gratification. They want the instant outcome. If it's not showing an ROI, 30 days on ROI, sometimes you, I, I feel like you may need to give some more time to something like this. Yeah, you wouldn't plant a seed and come back the next day and be really upset that your <laughs> tree hadn't grown. But yeah, people don't realize podcasting <laughs> is fun and having conversations is fun. Yeah. But the equipment, yeah. the tech, arranging the guests, the guest changing last minute, the tech yeah. issues. And for me, saying the same thing hundreds of times when I've been on hundreds of shows, <laughs> it's just there's a lot of things that stop you doing mm. it for a long time, but that just means the longer you're going, the less competition you have. Yeah. And the key component of podcasting, I feel, is the relationship building. The people that you get to sit down with and have a chat with, like you mentioned as well, is, is next level because now you're building a global uh, network as well. Not that every guest that you meet, you click with, but the opportunity is a lot more than any other forum, I feel. I know mm -hmm. 21 billionaires, and I wow. would say 15 of them were through this show interviewing them. And go back to 20 years ago when I knew no one, I didn't know any billionaires. Another thing about yeah. podcasting is, if you email a billionaire and go, hey, can we meet for lunch and swap WhatsApp numbers? Yeah. <laughs> They're just going to bin you off. But yeah. if you invite them on your show to have a conversation on a podcast, well, that's a door opener. Yeah, it is indeed. I would love to meet those billionaires as well. If you have a warm heart to introduce <laughs> us, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, so that would be I wonderful. I do have a warm heart. I'm not sure I'm just going to send you my 21 billionaires. <laughs> you know. Just, you don't need to do all of them. Silence there. It was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for a yes or no, but it was a silence. <laughs> but no, I great listening to you on Clubhouse too in the past. Your energy is is next level. You know what you're doing for people and what you're doing in the marketplace. It stands out. Your guest lineup, the way you interview, the passion that you express in everything that you do. And that one, the first question I have is, what do you do? Do you, do you have some sort of a mantra or do you have any mindset work that you do that, that gets you so enthusiastic about whatever you touch, whatever you do, it shows. I'm not saying it because I'm saying it just to, to say nice things to you. I'm saying it because it's expressed. It's expressed in the work it, it shows the passion, and you probably can speak about this. Is there anything that you can help others find that, that enthusiasm within to, to give that energy to the projects that they work on? Yes. So it's been scientifically proven that if you have a meaningful mission that yeah. aligns with your values, it literally lights your brain up and can so in many instances increase the longevity of your life. 
Obviously, yeah. there's many other factors to life longevity, mm -hmm. not just have a meaningful mission, but yeah. that is one of a series of factors. I believe biologically that as a species, those of us that are the most valuable to the species are more likely to live long. And those of us that are least valuable to the species are least likely to leave, live long. And mm. you having a mission mm. and a purpose and knowing exactly what you're meant to do with your life gives you an energy from within that trumps motivation or mantras or mm -hmm. ice baths mm -hmm. or exercise. Yes. People who are inspired, they don't need to eat much. They only need to eat enough. They don't need to sleep a lot. They only need to sleep enough. And they jump out of bed grateful to be alive. Mm. So, you know, I have challenges. I don't want to bore you with them, but I've got a lot of challenges going on right now. Probably mm. it's about the third hardest time in my life, I would say, with the challenges I have oh. going on. Yet I'm still inspired to get up. I got up at 2.30 this morning, a.m. to start work. And I'm still inspired on my mission to help as many people on this planet get better financial knowledge, which is why I don't bore of doing interviews and why I love coming to the office. We have 110 staff and why even the problems I'm inspired to do. Now, yeah. I want to just put things into perspective. When a lion dies alone, and is often eaten alive by hyena. So a lion will become progressively weak until it lays to die, and the hyena <laughs> will often come and devour off the flesh while the lion is still alive. Mm. And there's an English chap who was a really famous presenter. He went for a walk, and he mysteriously just died accidental maybe it was a heat stroke maybe he fell there are people in countries right now that have lost their children to wars they have nothing to do with and i think of these things every day when i don't feel inspired where i feel like things are hard where i have an energy problem where i want to maybe the ego wants to moan and complain and justify. I remember these things, how lucky I am mm. and how harder things could be and how privileged I am to be a 45-year-old white male born in a relatively safe country with relatively good upbringing. And no matter how hard things are for you, if you can be grateful for what you've got, because there's many mm. other people who've got it worse, then you're always going to be good. You're going to have energy. Yeah. I love it, Rob. That's awesome. That is the foundation, especially when we wake up in the morning, when we have that why, when we have that mission, it, it changes everything. It adds a bounce to our step. And that bounce is so important for the quality of work we do and how much of we do it and the passion that we put into it. You are well known in the multiple streams of income and hopefully the troubles that you're facing right now. And I'm sorry to hear uh, they're not about uh, the multiple sources of income, but could you speak about a, a less, a lesser known strategy for creating a, a income stream that has worked well for you in the past or you're looking to work on? currently yeah i can give you the formula for creating multiple streams yeah. of income that most people get wrong what mm -hmm. most people do are oh, do a bit of forex trading do a bit of property do a bit of content on social media start a podcast be a lawyer and they are doing a diverse range of different vocations trying to build multiple streams of income that is the wrong way to do it that it is virtually impossible to be able to do it quick enough or well enough. Mm. If you actually study people who have multiple streams of income, because the average millionaire has three to nine income streams, but if you actually study them and what they do, they started with one niche, they got good at it, and then they were able to add streams of income to that niche. So this is what I did. I'll, I'll take you all the way back. 
So I tried all sorts of different businesses, tried to be an artist, tried to run my dad's pub, tried to sell stuff on eBay and online e-commerce, and they were all different. And so it was very difficult to get all of them to work. And I was just working more and more. And what you do is you dilute the income streams. So instead of having three big income streams, you just have a third of what you could earn full time. So you're defeating the object. And then, excuse me if I snivel, I've just got a bit of a cold. No worries. So then I got into real estate. And initially, I worked for someone selling real estate. So packaging up properties and selling them to clients working for someone else. And then evenings and weekends, my business partner and I, we started buying for ourselves. So we're selling for others and then buying for ourselves. And there's a lot of 80% of what you do selling deals for others, you do for buying yourselves. And when you buy for yourself, you can really sell better deals to others because you know the process. So you buy for yourself, selling for someone else is only 20% extra work. And then we set up our own company and started sourcing for others, but our own company not working for someone else. And then people were saying, Rob, just teach us how to do it. So then I wrote a book and then we built a training company teaching others how to do what we did. And then when we bought enough properties for ourselves or our investors, we set up a management firm. Our management firm now has 1,350 tenants in it. Our own property portfolio has 340 units in it. We sold five to 600 deals. And now we have the UK's largest property training company, which it's done more than a quarter of a billion in revenue. Each one of those strategies, awesome. it, all, all it does is you only need to know an extra 20 or 25% on top of what you've already done. But if I bought property and then wanted to be a lawyer, and then I was a lawyer for a bit and then wanted to be a, a trader, I'm starting again. And so I'm playing snakes and ladders and I'm getting up to number 72 and then down to square zero again. And I actually now have 14 different income streams that are all related to property business, or information. Hmm. Wonderful. What do you think is the reason for, for entrepreneurs or people that want to get into self-employment, jump around when it comes to multiple sources of income and not stick with one thing and make it, get it, reach somewhere, and then go to the next? Usually it's because what they're looking at over there looks easier than what they're doing over here. <laughs> The grass is greener. The, the right? whole, it, it, instead of looking at the green grass over there, water your own grass. Yeah. And maybe they fake spray painted it green because, you know, all these influencers who rent a Lambo <laughs> and an Airbnb. So don't believe yeah. how green their grass is. It's probably been filtered and photoshopped. And if you water <laughs> yours, it'll become green and it'll be for real. So yeah. it's either impatience, comparison to others, easily lured for something that looks get rich quick, being, being reactive to your emotions, not having mm. your own clear mission and vision. Because here's the thing, when you're clear on your own mission and vision, you don't get distracted by anyone else's. Mm. So it sounds more like inner work needs to be done. Yeah. People think it's the business model that's the most important part. Mm. The business model is one of the least important parts of mm -hmm. becoming a millionaire or a billionaire or just a nearly there. Because mm -hmm. if you take all the billionaires, yes, some are in real estate and some are in tech and some are in pharmaceuticals. But actually, if you spread some are in e-commerce, some are in media, some are in social media, they're actually across a diverse range of niches and, and businesses. Same with millionaires. So most business models, you could become a millionaire or a zero ed, depending on if you follow the correct fundamentals. Yeah, I said. When we start overthinking about our current position, and like you mentioned, the comparison syndrome, when we're looking at someone else, or we're looking at someone on social media, and we start comparing, then we start overthinking. And that overthinking, I feel like it, it pushes people backwards. Yeah, I'm right down the middle line on this because mm. the way I see it is the bigger the decision, the more you should think. Mm -hmm. So if you're overthinking and taking too long to do fairly short, small or low risk decisions, then overthinking is becoming a curse to you. It might be mm. that you're a bit of a perfectionist. It might be that you have some fears. It might be that you failed in the past. It might be that you're overanalyzing and over-researching. 
Mm-hmm. But if you're making massive life decisions, don't just quit your job because someone says so because they read Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Actually mm-hmm. think about, do I like my job? <laughs> Maybe. And let's say you like it, but you don't love it. Your goal might be to set up on your own, but you actually might be able to learn a lot from your current employment and do it in two or three or five years and then not have to have that famine that every entrepreneur has to have, especially if you've got children and you're middle-aged. Obviously, if you're 22 and you're living at home, you can take more risk. So Mm -hmm. I must admit that I'm a, a, a quick decision maker. Mm-hmm. And I used to think it was because I'm bold, I'm brave, and I'm good at making quick decisions. And, and often it is. But sometimes it's because I'm avoiding a hard decision. And I don't want to sit in the pain of it. But the bigger the decision, the more you have to sit in the pain of it, and the more you have to analyze it. My business partner and I, we have a 100 apartment block. It took five years to develop. And we had a loan agreed with a bank. And that loan was 2.94% over 12 years, which is about as low as you could humanly want. So the deal was amazing. But they have really hardcore debentures, charges, restrictions, personal guarantees, and covenants within that agreement. So you get the upside of the really low rate and therefore the high cash flow. But at the cost of if this goes wrong. So, for example, if it goes under a certain loan to value, they they can demand that we just pay the difference. So let's say the market drops and it goes down two or three million under their covenant. We have to pay it back immediately. Mm -hmm. And also they take all of our rent and then give us our share three months later, which is not a normal thing. So that was a big decision. And we probably went to seven different brokers and got 15 different loans and some were more expensive and less onerous on the agreement and vice versa. We, mm. had, we went with the low rate because mm-hmm. the bank was, this, it was a centrally guaranteed loan. And actually we have a lot of equity in it and we have provisions. So sometimes you do need to think more and overthink on these bigger existential and more important questions. Hmm. Rob, for me, what you're referring to is the anal- analyzing the data right behind a decision. What I was gearing towards overthinking is that, should I do this? Shouldn't I do this? The noise that happens in one's mind and they keep going over the same thing again and again, and overthinking. But looking at data to make a decision is a is, is logical thing to do when you're going out for a venture. Yeah, the paradox of what I've just said is now I'm going to contradict myself on purpose. I wrote a book called Start Now, Get Perfect Later. And mm. if you're in real estate, if your first deal is the best, you never get better. Your first deal in theory should be the worst. And your last mm. deal in theory should be the best because you should be getting better each time. So therefore, Mm -hmm. surely it's better to quickly do the first deal, even if it's not perfect, to get better. Mm -hmm. If you're a podcaster Mm -hmm. like yourself who's done hundreds of episodes, your first Mm -hmm. episode should be the worst. And Mm -hmm. your later episode should be the best in terms of your skill set of asking questions and Mm -hmm. how you can draw out information. So surely it's better to get the first episode out there. So Mm -hmm. I know that's the answer you were maneuvering for. And you are Mm -hmm. right. Where it's not a big risk. It's not a huge decision where no one's going to get hurt, where it doesn't really matter. You should get a version one out there, get some live data and testing, get some real-time feedback, and improve along the journey as opposed to waiting to be perfect before you start. Yeah, it's the analysis paralysis. You don't want to get stuck in that. And the, the quicker you can make mistakes, the better. What is success? What is building a business? It's a series of failures. And if anybody says, oh, I I don't fail, I'm perfect. I don't know if that's true because to get anywhere, like you must have must have hit the wall many times. If you want to clarify on that, is that true or not? In your journey, there were failures. Yeah. So again, I've got a paradoxical view on this. I want to give you some context Mm -hmm. here because Mm -hmm. I'm going to share 
an approach to answering your questions, which I believe that virtually no one does. And there's a reason. And I believe it's a more accurate, objective answer. And if you want to be successful and wealthy, you need to be as objective as possible, i.e. you need to know as close to possible the reality and not a fantasy. Mm -hmm. So if you ask any influencer anything, they'll usually give you a very extreme view, like overthinking is bad or overthinking is good. Most people won't tell you overthinking is good. What they're not able to do is give you context and a simultaneous dual-sided view. So now with this moving forward, that's how I'm going to answer all the questions. So have I ever failed in business? Yes and no. Yes, I've made mistakes. Yes, I've probably said things which I regret or we've executed launches which break or maybe we've let down some clients at times, even though our refund rate is under 3%, which is really low. and we care. However, I've not gone bust. I've not failed nine businesses. I saw Alex Hormozy on, and he's very influential in the business space, on LinkedIn say, first business failed, second business failed, third business failed, blah, 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 ninth business failed. That's, you should be proud of that. That's how you be successful. No, hmm. I don't want to screw nine investors. Well, you learn from set, them though. Nine sets of creditors. I don't want nine failures. You do not have to fail in nine businesses to be successful in the tech. Of course not. You don't want that. Nobody wants that, Rob. But no, if well, it Alex does Ormosi happen, you learn from it. Alex Ormosi is glorifying it on social media. Oh. And there's a, a lot of these Americanisms. Fail. Fail. So fail as a last resort, trying everything. What a lot of people do, like in the building trade, Five, one little mistake, oh, I'll go bust and wind the company up and start another one. How many of these nine failed businesses that Alex Hormozy posts about actually should he have carried on and, and pushed through and promised to pay all of the creditors? For example, Jordan Belfort, The Wolf of Wall Street. Obviously, many people are influenced by him and the film was great, but he screwed a load of creditors, investors over and got away without paying all of them back. Now, if I'd have lost investor money, which I never have, I probably would do a deal to pay them over a period of time because my conscience couldn't have it. Mm. And just use the veil of the LLP or the limited company or the LLC and go, yeah, screw you for your 100 million. I'm going to start another business. So this failure thing is two-sided. Fail, fail, small, fail, mm -hmm. fast. But don't mm -hmm. fail big over and over and screw people and then tell everyone on LinkedIn no, that it's no, how no. to be successful. Of course not. Of course not. But you say, so, of course not. But most people mm -hmm. don't get this. Mm -hmm. No, but it's just common sense, Rob. Nobody wants to fail in a big way. Everybody does their due diligence. Everybody does their work before taking on a business or even making an investment. They do all that common sense stuff. but to be afraid of failure and not taking a step could you could lose out because if you're just sitting there overthinking not taking the step if everything is looking good if you did all the research makes sense to you that you know what this is a good move to make but you continue to overthink and you don't take the action because of fear of failure because a lot of people say failure is success tax is this something that you got to pay but there's two different angles to this one both ways what you're saying is correct because if i'm going out and i'm glamorizing failure in a big way that is also is going extreme but when we're looking at a business opportunity we're doing all the due diligence like you do that's not overthinking per se that's like looking at the numbers looking at what this business can do for me and others that are involved and then you make a decision because the most successful people in the world, you might agree that they make quick decisions. Yeah, the most successful people in the world probably make big decisions slower and mm -hmm. they have a lot of resources and staff and money and big data to be able to collate all of that mass of data they need to be able to make quick decisions. So that it's a bit of a myth that they're just decision-making machines and they've got no fear. Fear is good. Mm. 
Fear is human. You cannot run away from fear. There's so many people that say you got to get rid of fear. No, fear is good and fear is human. It's an internal mechanism. However, you've got to contextualize the fear. Should I fear drinking this drink that I've just drunk? No. Should I fear answering a question to you honestly, even if people will judge me? No. Should I fear losing a hundred million pounds of investor money? Yes. Mm. So you should be aware of your fears. You're aware of them, aren't you? Because you feel yeah. them. It's contextualizing yeah, so them. What does it attentive. mean? Attentive. What does it mean? So if you have an irrational fear of going live on Facebook for five minutes or doing episode one of a podcast, and it feels like you're going to get eaten by a, a group of hyena, whatever they, <laughs> they're called, someone should put in the comments, a pride of hyena, a pack of hyena. Of course, yeah. that's irrational. Just do the fucking episode. Just, and mm. do you know what? The good thing about content on social media is if it doesn't work, no one sees it. So it doesn't matter anyway, because no one sees it. Mm. I sometimes look at my yeah, content that, that doesn't go viral and I'm like, oh, it's looking really bad. No one's seen it for them to know that it looks bad. The worst thing right. is if you do a really bad piece of content and it goes viral and everyone sees it, that would be a worse yeah. experience. And maybe it went viral because it was bad. <laughs> so, maybe. <laughs> yeah, so, but no, yeah, definitely, definitely. On context. People yeah, are always just... looking at content before. You need context before content. Mm. Because just like our ego, to be aware of our ego, what is doing, how is holding us back, is it moving us forward, or being aware of our fears, where is popping up, am I fearful right now to go live, be aware of it, like you said, to be, to actually look deeper into that fear, but to have the fear pop up is going to happen. But when you fall into the fear and you become that fear, you lose the focus, you're not aware of it, you're in it, that just changes the dynamics then. You have authored many books. From last time I talked to you, I think it was one book a day you did for a while. No, sorry, one book a month. Uh, hopefully I'm right. Was no, it one you're book not. a month? Uh, like if I did one book a day, day I know, I'd, that's crazy. I'd, I'd be a squillionaire. Uh, <laughs> yeah, one, book a, a one book a year. Um, a year, I, I've, okay. I've been an entrepreneur nearly 20 years. And I've written 19 yeah. books. So it's one book a yeah, year on it. average. Yeah. yeah. So is there any one piece of advice or insight that you could share that is not in any of those books, but, the, but you live by it? Yes. The, there's a lot of information in my book, Money, and in my book, Money Matrix, and in my book, Start Now, Get Perfect Later. And I don't write about religion or politics or family because that for me is private. All of that aside, there's something that I'm going to write about in a future book about money. And people think that money buys things. Money doesn't buy things. Money is a lever. Money is a store of value. Money is your time exchanged, stored in that form of money, a gold coin, a silver coin, a paper note, or a digit in a bank account. So instead of thinking that this $20 buys something, remember it was your two hours of time you exchanged for this $20. So it's your time that buys things. You're swapping your time for what the money buys. When you really think about that, it's simple, but not simple. When you really think about that, that should give you some kind of visceral emotional reaction. And if it doesn't, you don't understand it. Because what this means is, if you're not doing, look, we all have challenges and we all have to do jobs we don't want to do. And you're a realistic guy who's running a realistic show. So you'll know that as an entrepreneur, you don't work for yourself. You work for your suppliers. You work for your clients. You work for your community. You work for the IRS or the Inland Revenue. You work for a lot of other people, not just yourself. When you have the naive fantasy that you work for yourself as an entrepreneur, I get paid after all my staff. And all my staff will get paid even if I don't make any profit that month. So you could argue I work for my staff more than they work for me. So yes, you can make choices. 
And yes, you can make big decisions, but it is a naive fantasy to think that you work for yourself. So the reason I'm saying that is you have to be realistic about the realities of being an entrepreneur. People who have massive companies work for all the investors. That being said, if you don't enjoy most of what you do, you are literally exchanging your life for it. Mm -hmm. If you're employed and you're paying all, maybe 70% of what you earn and what you spend in tax, you're working seven out of 10 of your hours for the government. Mm -hmm. And if you have a low hourly rate, you're working longer and longer for a smaller amount of fair exchange. So be aware of that when you choose what you do and you choose where you work and you choose what your vocation is and you choose how you spend your time. So here are a few little hacks. Number one is I always make sure if I'm exchanging my time, can I get duplicate or triplicate from it? Now, if anyone's as old as me and remembers when things were done with paper, you used to have receipts that you'd write and there would be a little blue piece of paper underneath and it would duplicate and triplicate the receipt. So Mm. unless you paid me probably 10 grand for this episode, if I couldn't reach your audience and if I couldn't record it and use it to reach more of an audience, I wouldn't do it. But I've got extra leverage value out of this episode because we're recording it in-house. We can use shorts from it. You'll put it on your show. I'll put it on mine, for example. When I mentor people, I mentor in WhatsApp groups and I send them voice memos. And then I have AI transcribe them and I put them into master documents, which write systems and manuals and processes and resource documents, which I can use to get extra benefit. When I'm going somewhere to, be, to do a speech, I'll have my driver drive me and I'll work in the back of the car. So I'm getting layers of extra benefit. When I, I want to do 20,000 steps a day. So I'll go and do my voice memos and my steps at the same time. So I'm getting a double effect so that I'm not wasting time. Because otherwise, I have to give all my time to exchange it for this paper thing, knowing that's inflating and most of it is going to pay tax. So let me say it again. Money doesn't buy anything. There's two things that buy things. One, the amount of time you exchange for that money. And two, the amount of value that you give in that amount of time. So the more valuable you become, you can spend one hour and earn 10,000 instead of 10 pounds. That's something I've not precisely written about like that, that I will in future money books. Mm, Well said. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing that, Rob. And thank you so much for giving us the time today. We usually keep the episode 30 minutes or less. Grateful to speak to you about all the information that you shared today. There's information that gives a, a different view about what some may say it gives a a different concept to it and you did that very well and i appreciate you definitely keep in touch and when we go live we'll send you an email thank you very much Take care.